off um, in a moment to start the webinar with a look at the new Oasis and highlight all that's exciting and new, as well as tell you why we really think you should be using it. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've got Tim um, Evans from the Archaeological Data Service joining us um, at the end of my first slot for a question and answer session. So I'd really like to have a think about what you might like to ask Tim, as it's a really a great opportunity. I'm pretty sure that Tim knows everything there is to know about Oasis. He certainly knows far, no, far more than I do. Um, and I'm really pleased he's been able to join us today. So thanks, Tim, for that. Moving on from OASIS, um, Manda's going to look more broadly at digital data in archaeology projects and also discuss the relevance of the FAIR principles to our work. She'll consider how these four principles are relevant to archaeology and how the profession can go about trying to achieve them. Manda will consider this from the perspectives of both OASIS, but also from individual archaeological projects, and will then be hosting a discussion around how we can make our data FAIR. We'll then have a bit of a discussion about how the FAIR principles map against CIFA standards and guidance in relation to archaeological pro projects, OASIS and archives management. At this point, we'll take a quick five minute comfort break. Um, I appreciate it's a long time to sit and look at a screen and listen to us. And one thing that's become quite clear to me putting this together is that Oasis and Archives are not the most visually engaging of subjects. So you're going to have to bear with me and do quite a bit of listening if that's OK. When we reconvene, Manda will introduce the Dig Digital project and um, look at new guidance and tools which aim to help the everyday management of digital data. We'll then discuss the challenges of data management in project workflows um, and using existing resources as a starting point, we'll look at how organisations can navigate projects into a fairer archive world. Finally, um, through the projects Manda, Ash and I are currently working on, we're going to be looking at developing additional tools and resources to support organisations um, in creating and managing data. The final section of today's workshop will see a discussion session asking you what support you feel might be needed for your organisations to implement some of the processes discussed. We want to know what training um, might staff need within your organisations. We think we've got some ideas, but it'd be useful to hear from you what you think you need. Would the development of a user support community be attractive to you? We think it would, but you might think otherwise. Who knows? So do you think organisations would benefit from access to peer-to-peer -peer networks for support and advice? And these are just some of the things we're going to consider later on. So just quickly before I ask Doug to launch the first poll, a spot of housekeeping. I'm pretty sure by now, given the circumstances of this um, strange old year, you're all familiar with Zoom. But in case not, here's a few things that might help. Um, you'll see participants are muted and we've, we've mentioned that already. But when it comes to the discussion session, you can raise your hand. We can unmute people and we'll be able to allow you to talk. Hopefully you can all see the chat window and um, you can use this at any time as needed. And we'll be using it later on to link to things like um, Manda's Jamboard, which are going to be used in today's session. The question and answer area can be used at any time to ask questions to all of us and to Tim. Um, as a presenter, it's quite confusing to monitor that question and answer. So if I don't reply, reply immediately, forgive me on that, but we will pick it up at some point. And I suggest you use it um, to start to ask questions ready for Tim when he's going to join us after I've finished talking. And um, you can send in your questions anonymously as well, if you prefer, by selecting that option. Right, I'm going to ask Doug to launch the poll um, and give you a few minutes to answer before I start to look at the new Oasis with you. What's new about Oasis? Well, quite a lot. Um, <laughs> In November 2019, Historic England put out to tender a project to provide support workshops for the rollout of the new Oasis. MSDS Marine and Ash Tree Heritage, through Ash and myself, are now delivering that project. And through us, Historic England are providing training and support to the wider sector to promote the new system and provide training to stakeholders. Um, we really aim to be able to help support organisations and individual users on their journeys to becoming more confident in the use of Oasis. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick overview now of, of some of the things that we're doing and Oasis itself. I'm really hopeful that everyone here knows what Oasis is and indeed has experience of its use. After all, it's been a very familiar feature in the landscape of the historic environment sector for nearly 20 years now. It's been developed and hosted by the ADS on behalf of Historic England and Historic Environment Scotland. And over that time, it's enabled the reporting and transfer of information about archaeological investigations from those carrying out fieldwork to historic environment records, national heritage bodies and the ADS Digital Library. And it's really transformed the way grey literature reports are made accessible online.
The overall aim of the OASIS project is to provide an online index to the massive archaeological grey literature that's been produced as a result of the advent of large scale developer funded fieldwork and a similar increase in fieldwork undertaken by voluntary and community groups. As part of this overall vision, the OASIS data capture form has been designed to help in the flow of information from data producers, such as contracting, contracting units and community groups, through to local and national data managers, such as HERs. Grey literature reports are also made available directly through the ADS library, where you can search and retrieve reports based on a variety of different data fields. OASIS really does help to facilitate the rapid flow of information from producer to user. And the impact of OASIS on the sector has been hugely significant, in particular in providing open access to a vast body of grey literature reports generated through the planning system. Download figures show that OASIS reports have been accessed over 30,000 times per year, with this figure slowly rising as the library grows, which is quite phenomenal, really. So, What's happening now? Well, the heritage data landscape is changing and with it, so is OASIS. In England, there's a greater emphasis on a more coordinated and simplified data sharing approach through Historic England's Heritage Information Access Strategy, often referred to as HIAS. Likewise, Scotland's Historic Environment Data, or SHED, aims to improve access to historic environment information. OASIS will play a key role in these strategies by providing the mechanism to share information and data outputs across the whole of the sector. The Herald project is essentially the OASIS redevelopment project and it's a key component of HIAS. The first stage was a user need study which surveyed the historic environment community to see how they might use OASIS in the future and what changes were needed for the system to bring it up to date. In line with feedback from users and supporting the strategic aims of both HIAS and SHED, OASIS has gone through a process of redevelopment. This has been undertaken throughout 2020 and will lead to significant improvements to meet the needs of a modern historic environment community. The new OASIS is being designed to record all forms of historic environment investigations, including building recording and all forms of archaeological projects, even including maritime, which as a maritime archaeologist myself, I'm delighted about. It is aimed at the whole sector too, including academic and community researchers, researchers along with museum organisations for the first time. The new OASIS, um, sometimes referred to as OASIS 5, is not an insignificant undertaking. There are over 1,400 registered organisations and in excess of 92,000 records, as well as hundreds of edits and new records created each week. The ADS want to ensure that moving to the new system is a carefully managed process with minimal interference to workflows and duplication of effort. If you've been to the landing page this week, you may have spotted it all looks a little different. There are links to the old system and the brand new one, but for now, ADS recommend that you continue to use the old system as normal until they tell you directly that your new account is up and running with users validated and your records migrated. This is quite simply because the ADS want to avoid a mass event as they don't really know the impact of moving all the users and records across in one go. And they're being cautious and want to avoid both an overwhelmed system and overwhelmed users and to ensure that their help desk has the capacity to help everyone who needs it. So what's new? Well, first of all, the new Oasis not only looks rather brilliant, but it has a range of new features and functions. From a user perspective, um, I think it certainly feels a lot easier to navigate around. It looks clean, fresh and simple, and it's a lot more intuitive to use to enter data. The biggest change, I think, is that OASIS is a flexible system now that will support the work of all units. It will improve communication reporting of investigations. Organisations will now be able to manage the number of users from their organisation with access to OASIS um, by appointing an administrator for your organisation. And that administrator will be able to add and delete users as needed. It will also allow um, registration of new users and registration of users across organisations with the appropriate role being selected when you log in. So you can log when you log in, you can select which organisation you're logging in on behalf of. The workflow is no longer linear, um, so records will remain open in order to indicate when archives are deposited. This can be useful to units for signposting um, publications on your own websites. Um, and with the addition of museum organisations to OASIS, information such as museum collecting areas and whether a museum is accepting archives or not will be much more readily available and easy to see. Museums will also be able to view OASIS records and record data such as um, their accession numbers.
This link between units and museums really does close the loop in terms of archive deposition. It facilitates communication and will really will result in greater accessibility to the location of archives where these have been successfully deposited. It should be noted that while an OASIS record remains open to accommodate, accommodate um, archive deposition, the report, once it's uploaded to OASIS, will continue to work its way through the system and will be uploaded to the ADS library within six months in most cases. Another new feature is that organisation profiles are now linked between o ADS and OASIS, which increases efficiency and saves time. There are a series of um, new OASIS Plus modules as well that capture specialist information in areas such as geophysics and burial spaces, as well as a bespoke workflow for historic building survey and investigation. One feature that some of our team particularly like is that ORCID IDs can now be added to OASIS records, enabling individuals to take full credit for their work throughout their career and across organisations, which I think is particularly nice. Long term, the aim is for OASIS to provide an automatic feed to online regional research frameworks in order to keep the frameworks more dynamic and updated. And um, this is something that's currently being worked on. So do watch this space in that case. Um, I just want to say something about linked open data and a big change in the new OASIS is the use of linked open data vocabularies. These derive from the Forum for Information Standards in Heritage, um, the FISH National Theosauri, which are used across the UK. The lookup of control keywords removes typo errors on terms, it greatly improves data indexing and searching, and it makes OASIS data fair, something that Amanda will talk to you about more later on. Um, and for anyone who wants to have a look, there are also code widgets and further information on the Heritage data site about how to incorporate linked open data into other online resources. So it's definitely worth having a look. So why should you use it? Wow, a key development of the new OASIS is that it will improve relationships between different elements of the sector by facilitating communication and closing the gaps within project life cycles. The future legacy of OASIS can be expressed in one word, connectivity. With the redevelopment comes the opportunity to broaden the use of OASIS across the whole historic environment sector, thereby enabling it to be more inclusive of all investigations, not just those undertaken as part of the planning process. Linking all aspects of a project, especially reports and archives, will result in a more connected project life cycle, while the introduction of museum users will allow greater communication and signposting with regards to archive deposition. The new OASIS really can become a central hub for the recording of archaeological events from across the whole of the historic environment sector. It also affords us the opportunity to create a national database of archives, not just the location of physical archives, but direct link to digital archives as well. And this not just increases accessibility to information for the end user, but it can also facilitate the creation of large scale research projects. This connectivity will also not just be seen through the project life cycles, but also through connecting of people from all parts of the sector. With the new form comes the ability to communicate directly through the system, thereby encouraging the development of relationships, leading to a lasting digital legacy for the historic environment. So there's many benefits to the sector from using Oasis, but for it to be a success, it really needs all of us to get behind it and to champion its use, both within the archaeological community, but also externally. A key facet of the rollout um, of the rollout project that we're working on is the creation of a self-supporting and self-sustaining user community. We're hoping that the project will help to ensure an engaged community of users who are provided with support materials. The historic environment sector as a community can support each other and ensure the success of the new OASIS system in many ways. And we'll talk about this later on in the day, but it's worth flagging here also that ADS will be providing a user help desk and um, myself and Ash will be providing a series of resources designed to help support users. The success of the new OASIS will be reliant on take up within the sector and the creation of a community that embraces it and helps support one another in its use. So if this is going to work, we need everyone to get behind it. If you want to know more about the new OASIS and how to use it, then do sign up to one of our full OASIS workshops designed to support the rollout. Um, we're still finalising content and these will come online later in the year. We're tailoring them to different audiences from commercial archaeologists to people working in historic environment services or in specialisms such as built heritage or maritime archaeology, um, as well as for community groups, museums, specialists, freelancers and people just starting out in their careers. So there will be a series 
series of tailored courses which are free um, and available to everybody and you can sign up online for those you can drop me an email and you can just stay posted on social media because we will be providing dates fairly shortly so at this point, um, I would very much like um, to talk to Tim Evans from ADS, who's been the driving force behind the new Oasis. Um, he knows more than anyone else on the planet about Oasis. So now is the time to take advantage and ask him anything you might want to know about it and what's new. Are you there, Tim? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thanks for that, Glowing Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. If, if it's okay with you, I'm going to kick off and ask you the first question. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. I thought I would do while you're here. How is the rollout going this week and when do you see it being completed? Uh, it should be finished this week. It's actually uh, somebody needs to press a button in the office uh, for the new system to come online, but they've been poorly this week. So they're back at work today. So hopefully by the end of today. It'll be back online, but all of the, hopefully all of the attendees here, their organisation will have already been emailed about Oasis and their account and the various steps and things we need to do. So kind of under the hood, it's going okay. It's just that kind of one final uh, public step that needs to happen. Excellent. Well, has anyone got any questions? I can't, I'm just having a quick look in the Q&A and I can't see anything at the moment. Is anybody want to use this opportunity to talk to Tim? If not, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, so, yeah, right. Are there any plans for further um, Oasis Plus modules? Because I think I'm correct in saying at the minute there's the, um, the geophysics one and the burial spaces, but mm -hmm. is there anything else coming online and can people request these? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think as a whole, I think cause it's a brand new system. I think as a whole, we're in always interested to hear kind of uh, what user needs are going forward. The old Oasis stayed monolithic since 2007. So for 13 years, it's been exactly the same. We hope it gets a bit more iterative in the future so that users can kind of feedback to HE or HES and say, well, actually, we need this. Um, but in the short term, we have got penciled in an Oasis Plus module for human bones recording, human remains. And we've been talking to Babio members about how they might like to record um, their various criteria. And there is work in the offing for a paleoenvironmental uh, database uh, put in as well. So, yes, these things will happen probably in the next year to two years. And today, then we just check it out a bit more. I've got a question on that now, actually, from, from Matthew Hobson, which says, will there be a map search function to the new Oasis? Um, can people search records that are close to an area of interest using an interactive map? Not in this immediate version, but yes. Um, we are building what we're calling an advanced dashboard for users. So when you first come onto the system, it will be the same old uh, uh, search criteria, search for your projects. Um, we are going to build a map that will be available to all users that will be able to show the distribution of projects for which they have rights to. So if you're a big unit, for example, you can see all of, say, Wessex or Oxford's uh, points on a map. In terms of public access to this data, uh, we're working on that, but certainly the ADS library which is the kind of front end for discovering of the reports, that will get a map this year, definitely. So Excellent. We're aware that, so it's, that where we are is so spatial in terms of uh, what users want, so we're committed to try and keep up with that as best. That'd be brilliant. I've got another question for you. Is the submission information for a project the same as before or are there changes? The land classification was always a field that we struggled with as it's not routine info. Um, so what, and can you generate an accurate reference for the for grid reference for the site? Uh, starting with the grid reference. So there are numerous ways to locate your site. You can put in a grid reference, alphanumeric, numeric um, in OSGB or decimal uh, longitude and latitude. Uh, you can also upload a uh, shape file of your extent of area, which automatically plugs you in the right place. That spatial data is then stored in the database and then that uh, generates geology automatically from a British Geological Survey uh, web map service. 
So no longer people have to type in sand and gravel and variants of the BGS will return the right geology. There still is in the geophysics module a land use classification, but it's been slimmed right down to very, very broad classifications. But a lot of what you'll see in Oasis is automatically generated. There'll be a lot less um, free text boxes for users to kind of uh, ponder over. And indeed, a few fields from the old system have gone completely because the feedback from level one users is they're just no use. So they have been cut. Excellent. I've got a, another question for you. Can one record be used for a site which has multiple techniques? So on a project where you've got geophysics, evaluation, building, recording, can, will that be in one record? Uh, that, that is a good question. Yes. Yes, you can uh, put in as many techniques as possible. I think in Scotland, where HES are a lot more, um, uh, yeah, Oasis feeds into Canmore, HES are very focused on one technique per record. So if you're working in Scotland, the guidance might be different. In England, I think it will really depend on what the HER would like to see. Some HERs are clumpers, as in they don't mind multiple, the watching brief, the evaluation, and a building survey all being in one record. Others like it to be uh, partitioned out into separate records. What you will see in New Oasis is actually the guidance from each HER will be there within the form. So if you're working in one part of the country, you'll see their guidance is, I would actually like to see two separate Oasis records here. Others will have different. So it will depend on the HER primarily, but we've built it flexibly so you can do both. Okay, so uh, this question relates to that. So say you've got a project where the geophysics is by one contractor and you've got the trenching by another. Will different units use the same record or will it be different records? Sorry, I understand. It will be different records um, if based on the contractor's piece of work. Okay, that's good to know. Um, another question which sort of relates to that. Also, can you link projects which relate to the same site but might be done by different organizations? Well, it's the same question, isn't it, really? But by done by different organizations at a different time. So is there any way to, to link by site at all? Yes, there is, a, there is a function to link by site. Um, you would have to know what that site is. So you will need the Oasis unique identifier, but um, the HER can add that, for example, or if you know of it, um, then you can put it in. Obviously, until a record is marked as complete, they're hidden from view between contractors, so you can't see other contractors' records. Yeah. There's a bit of a timeline issue there, but certainly because it's flexible, you can go back and add these IDs in, and then that acts as a linkage throughout to tie schemes together, whether that's a big scheme or a small scheme that works. Uh, that's Brilliant. Well, I have to say, I think it's looking really, really good. Um, it, having had a look like over the last few weeks, I think, I think it, it, it's all coming together really nicely. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat window, which is why I'm, I'm reading them out to you. Um, we've got just about spatial linking, but I think you've just sort of said about that, that different contractors are going to need different records. Um, in terms of archives, will museums be able to add in legacy information from already deposited archives? Yes. Um, Brilliant, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, there'll be a lot to catch up on. Uh, mm. I think just to uh, quickly respond to, I see Matt Beam, she's put a kind of second one on there about yeah. spatial linking. I think certainly if you're thinking about the ADS library at the moment, which has got no map based search in the future when we deploy it. So you will be able to see records from the same units side by side and you will be able to filter a lot more. But within the OASIS system itself, while it's still a, while the contractors records guides we've been given is to kind of keep them hidden from each other until a point as they're uh, completed and signed off. Fab. So there's another question. Is the main aim of the new system to improve access for organisations contributing data? Do you mean access to data? To improve access for organisations contributing data? I don't know. I, I, I might read that in terms of um, it, to make it easier for us as archaeologists to enter that data, um, making it easier to, yeah, making it easier to submit. <laughs> I really hope so. <laughs> I, really, I really hope so. If it, if yeah. it and we failed catastrophically, it is meant to speed up 
um, the amount of time it takes to do an Oasis record. The old, the old system is really clunky and we know you have to kind of add a certain amount of information before it, you can even save the record. Um, yeah. you save the record on the first page and come back to it later. None of the sections are ever closed, so you can do the, the minimum standards, as it were, and get everything going, but then you can always go back to it when there's more to add. So it has been, one of the main drivers has been that units has to get these things done as quick as possible, spend as little time on it, and that ties in with the automation of data as well. Yeah, it is really intuitive, I have to say, like looking at it, it is, it's quite easy to fill in and it is quite it feels a lot more familiar in terms of things that people are used to doing in other areas of their, their jobs and lives. It, it, it is really user friendly. Um, right. If the new rollout of Oasis marks a change in the variety of information collected, how is this reflected in terms of records deposited under the earlier iterations of the system? Will these be manually edited to conform to the new data field structure? Uh, they've been mapped to the new structure. So first of all, no data will be lost, even if a field is no longer um, able to be updated, it will still appear there as kind of legacy data in the system. So we're not going to kind of throw anything away. Um, a lot of the mapping is actually very straightforward. Um, so you won't be radically surprised at how your new records look. What we have done is where, as Oasis use a lot of these controlled vocabularies now, Old Oasis didn't, is we've run a series of internal projects to map terms to these controlled vocabularies, where a mapping doesn't exist because the term just didn't fit our um, processes. It will just be stored there as a what we call a non-qualified term. But I think overall, you won't be massively surprised by how your data looks. Uh, the, the one thing we have noticed and we will have to come back to is grid references and where grid references are clearly in the wrong place. Uh, I think uh, ADS will just have to do some manual tie uh, tidying in partnership with the organisations uh, over the next few months. So don't be surprised if you get emails saying, we've noticed these, what, what should we do with these? And then we can sort it out for you, really. It's probably easier for us to do it at a database level than expecting a user to go through hundreds of records. So. And you're happy to do that? Yep. That's really nice to know. <laughs> and it, it's definitely, it makes everyone feel supported. So that's really good. Is there any other questions? I think we've answered everything that's coming on the chat and the Q&A. Um, is there anything else you want to say before I hand over to Amanda, Tim? Uh, no, it's just that those are in it. I think it is, as you mentioned, Alison, in, in your um, introduction, uh, this stage is difficult in terms of moving you all over. Uh, we won't, we'll try to keep the communication as uh, clear as possible on a one-to-one -one basis based on your unit and your records and we won't move anything over or we won't change anything until we're happy that the person we're talking to is happy and then we'll do a thing. Um, if you have any questions about this particular process, um, please do email me at herald.ad ads.ac.uk, which is the redevelopment project account. And it just means that I can push it over to other members of staff and we can get it sorted as quickly as possible. Do you want to put that email address in the chat, Tim, so that everyone's yeah. got access to it? And um, that'd be really good. OK, I'm going to finish then for now. And I am going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to hand you over to Manda, who is going to talk to you um, about the FAIR principles in archaeology. I am. The day is just going to keep getting more and more exciting as we go forward. Um, the, a couple of people, or I think, Bob, you asked about FAIR principles as Alison was talking, and this presentation should hopefully answer that question. Um, just before we get going, I've got this strange idea <laughs> of an interactive part of this presentation where I'm going to ask people to use something called Jamboards if they want to. I've included the link to that in the chat window. Essentially, it's a Google based uh, whiteboard system where you can stick post it notes on. So when we get to that point, I'll say, let's hop over to Jamboards. If you can't use it or if the, the device that you're using this on just makes life really difficult because you're only using a, a, a small screen, then the questions are ones that you could add into the chat window, some responses to and, and um, we can include the information on the Jamboard our, ourselves. So it was just really to have a little bit of a different approach so you don't just sit and listen to us talking the whole time. So I'm going to 
get my presentation up and I'm going to share the window. Yeah, it has. So I can't see the chat window. So maybe um, Alison and Ash, if you could keep an eye on that and just um, speak <laughs> if you can. I will monitor the chat and the Q&A, <laughs> Amanda. It's, it's hard to see when you've swapped over to present view. That was what got me too. Yeah, I think it's probably hiding behind something, but we'll see. Um, so is it fair? Um, so probably to kick off, I should mention that this um, project itself is part of a wider project looking at standards and guidance in oh, oh sorry i'm covering my shared screen now um looking at standards and guidance in data management throughout projects um as dig ventures we're developing the project in partnership with cfa but it's a he funded um project which we're carrying out on behalf of the archaeological archives forum and i'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well introducing the fair guiding principles itself they're essentially a universal set of principles that underpin good data management approaches. They're not specific to heritage or archaeology, and they're not something that we've just made up. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know. Um, they're something that developed in 2016. A whole group of researchers from across academia, industry and other bodies published essentially a call to action to their peers and colleagues to adopt a culture of good data management. So this wasn't just as a primary goal or as an output from research itself, but to lend itself as a key conduit leading to knowledge, discovery and innovation. So this is about presenting your research and information and then letting people look at what sits behind some of those conclusions. Um, rather than being aimed purely at open access for humans, the published principles are built as a guideline to enhance reusability, which also emphasizes the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data, as well as used by individuals, of course. Fair data principles have been quickly adopted by researchers across many fields of investigation and seen as accepted good practice, and also cited as a requirement of some funding initiatives. So uh, funding bodies like AHRC and NERC both cite FAIR principles as a, a, a good guide for how to um, curate your data. Mostly they're recognised as making good sense. So promoting the idea that the research data has legacy beyond the closure of the project itself. And this is an idea that obviously is not uncommon to archaeologists or to those working in heritage. So what is a FAIR archaeological archive? It's worth discussing FAIR principles in relation to how they're relevant to our sector. Um, making our archaeological archives accessible is a requirement of CFA's suite of standard and guidance documents, which I'm sure everyone is fully aware of. <laughs> this means they are a necessary output of all planning archaeology undertaken, but is also an industry-wide expectation within other projects. This is a fundamental principle of the professional code of conduct, so the CFAS professional code of conduct, I should say, which means that all accredited members and registered organisations should be meeting that standard. The standard itself, so that standard relating to archaeological archives, is not new. That's always been around. The guidance has been updated, but the standard itself has remained the same, and that's what I'll be talking a little bit about later. So back to first principles, why do we even keep archives. Our starting point is that archives of course are important, they have value and they need to be looked after. At the quote from uh, Jennifer Baird and Leslie McFadden suggests, so the quote on the screen here, the archaeological archive constitutes a knowledge base essential to facilitate the reanalysis and reinterpretation of a site. It is the material we choose to retain and keep for long-term preservation ensuring that archaeological sites that are disturbed or even destroyed by investigation remain accessible to us all. Um, not a new idea for, um, for archaeologists, but one worth remembering why we keep archives. So thinking about a typical archaeological archive, perhaps one that you can see on the screen here, um, this one's already arrived at its long-term destination. It's one of the Cambridge archives in the um, deep store salt mines. All of those finds, plans, photographs, site records are packed into boxes with labels. They're ordered and they correspond to a catalogue. You can search for an object or a document and you can hopefully find it. Um, you can also open the finds bag, look at the pottery, unroll the plan and expect the original drawn record. So 
the idea is the material itself can be reappraised, it can be found, it can be reanalyzed and subject to new scientific techniques. That's the point of the archaeological archive. We keep them so we continue to learn from them. Our archive material forms part of an ongoing quest to know more or may even form part of an exhibition. Importantly, the archaeological project itself continues to contribute to society. But how does that work with digital data and accessing information online? Archaeologists love new tools and gadgets and as a profession, we're quick to absorb new technologies. Think about the ways we all use digital data throughout an archaeological project. The process itself is saturated with digital data. Although we still carry the buckets and trowels, we're never too far from a laptop or a digital camera and site survey data is recording using our trusty GPS receivers. We can carry our archaeological projects around with us on a USB stick. Digital data itself is neither new nor futuristic. This is stuff that we've been doing for a while now. <laughs> it's part of the everyday archaeological toolkit and should be an intrinsic part of the archaeological archive. But currently that does not seem to be the case. So during the late 90s, if we can go back that far, um, the use of floppy disks pretty much disappeared and was replaced by zip drives and then CDs. Since then, USB sticks are ubiquitous and data can be stored within the cloud. We can access gigabytes of storage anywhere via smart devices and laptops. One of the big worries of media changeovers is often accessibility, data essentially being lost as the media itself becomes outdated. Archaeologists have been pretty good at making sure old data does not become obsolete. So moving file types or servers to new information to make sure it remains accessible, although I'm sure we've all probably got examples of when that hasn't happened. Um, Beyond the project itself, so beyond the working project archive or outside of an organisation, the integrity and accessibility of that digital data can often seem to drop off a cliff. An Algeo funded project planning for archives was undertaken as part of Historic England's 21st century challenges for archaeology. It examined the relationship between planning policy and archaeological archives and threw up some really interesting stats <laughs> as well as the key findings relating to physical archives um, looking at their digital counterparts between 2013 and 2018 showed some real disparities between what was expected to be deposited and what actually ended up in um, accessible systems so between 2013 and 2018 approximately 43,000 projects are estimated to have taken place only 424 digital archives were deposited with ADS during the same time period, so that is less than 1%. And whilst you might argue that some projects won't be completed and deposited within that time frame, this is still a pretty low number. Um, we don't have the corresponding information for physical archives, but I'm sure it would be higher. What this is essentially saying is that the digital component of an archive is currently most likely to be inaccessible publicly irrespective of the status of the physical archive. Basically, and in my opinion, <laughs> the accessibility of data relating to archaeology is pretty much stuck in the 90s with those floppy disks, which is why uh, we have felt or why the Archives Forum have felt that it was a good time to start thinking about FAIR principles, archaeology and the desire to make research information more accessible. So it'll be no surprise to anybody that the FAIR of the FAIR data principle stands for something else, as we all love an acronym. Um, this includes these four words, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. These are the four elements which underpin the FAIR principles. If we can achieve these within our projects, then we are doing very well for our digital data archives. So now for a bit of interactivity, um, I'm going to open up the Jamboard, which hopefully people have been able to see. So I can see that there are indeed a few people here. I still, for some reason, can't see the chat window. Um, oh, here we are. Now I have finally got it up. So what this does, is it's like a whiteboard, essentially, and um, we can put on post-it notes. So down the left hand side, if you're using this in the screen and you're able to interact with it, you should be able to select the sticky notes option and you can write your note in there. 
So findable, um, sorry, so you can add notes to the screen. Um, in the findable section, what I was going to ask people to do was to include some ideas of what they think findable means for just more generally for digital archives and just add the notes in the circle or around the circle and then maybe have an idea of what findable means or how we can use um, frameworks that we already have in archaeology to, to kind of achieve findable in our archaeological projects. Does that make sense? Anyone that can talk? There we go. It People makes sense it. and we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if people put their ideas, I'm, I'm going to also keep an eye on the time because um, I'm very aware that we could go through this. What I'm then going to go um, through is each one of these words. I'll include the um, how I've spoken about it within the Dig Digital as well on the next slide and then try and think about what we could use to make things more findable. I think I suspect people will be able to see where this is heading. Uh, but it's more to just, I, I think what's really interesting about the FAIR principles is um, actually if you break them down into those individual words, is thinking about what that really means in terms of how we do our work as archeologists and what things are already in place that we can use to help facilitate those things. So um, what do we have up here? So. Findability using standard search engines, um, something like an Oasis index. Yeah, so that's a really good point. And I put that one right smack bang is how, how is that findable for archaeology? Um, searchable key terms. Data is organized within a standardized structure and the public can search and find. I think one of the key points in terms of findability is exactly that, that there's something unique about that archive that people can actually uh, look for and they can actually find. So it does kind of make sense when you think about the word. Um, in terms of other materials, so not just digital material, that might be looking at museum catalogues, for example, um, but mainly to do with the digital data, it's via things like the OASIS records, or um, you could also think about the HER systems and Heritage Gateway or um, any other types of catalogues where you can look for sites and find things. So I'm going to show you now the next frame. I think you can still, can you still see my screen? I guess so. Um, so findable, the digital archive from your project is uploaded to a public repository and rich metadata are assigned a unique and persistent identifier. What's really important about the FAIR principles is it's not simply about the digital data itself, but it's about the information about the data. That's where metadata comes in. Um, it's a word that we talk about a lot, and I think it's banded around a lot when we talk about digital data. Um, it's information about data, and there are different ways that it appears within archeological projects, which we'll talk about a bit later as well. Um, the, the the most important thing I guess about it is it within the digital data archive it means that you can cite that information so if you were to look at the data archive itself what you're looking for is information that you can individually cite to do with different aspects of that archive or to do with the whole archive itself and I think the next question is about how does Oasis make your project findable so if anybody wants to throw up an idea on there um, I think Alison probably answered that in her introductory talk. Has anybody got any ideas how Oasis might make projects findable? The resounding silence. Yeah, so Matt in the window there is said spatially, so you'll be able to see where the project is and you'll be able to find the, it will signpost the information that's in there. So essentially the OASIS record for each site provides that findability. It will have a DOI, which is a digital um, identifier that's unique to the project. 
And that means that you'll not only be able to find it, but you'll be able to share where you found it with other people if you then cite it in other research and other publications. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. OK, so we'll have a look at maybe accessibility. I'm just going to keep on going with the Jamboard thing. I hope people find it uh, useful. Um, <laughs> Oh, Matt said the, the tab won't load for me. What I could do after this is actually download the, the PDF of the Jamboard if people would like to see what other people were saying. Um, but otherwise, we'll just try and keep talking through things. In terms of accessibility um, for an archaeological archive, what would that mean? In, or what does that mean generally compared to what it might mean for us in archaeology? Does anybody have any ideas around that? Perfect, not behind a paywall, exactly. So actually including information in a way that people can find access and not have to pay for is a great uh, part of accessibility. And yet accessing the data itself rather than just an index for it or and not just the metadata. So there you go, another angle on metadata that you can't have the archive without the metadata, but the vice versa is also true. And Sinead just mentioned spoken text for blind people. And I think actually user accessibility is something that we've not actually spoken much about in archaeology and, and within archives and is something that we should increasingly start to do. And in terms of the next, I'm just going to flick through to the next question. Um, so in terms of the definition, I guess, that I've used within the Dig Digital project is that digital material including both data and metadata should be retrievable in a variety of formats which is usable by both people and machines. Anyone with access to the internet should be able to access at least the metadata, but taking the point that somebody mentioned that you sh shouldn't just be the metadata, um, associated with the research project and to understand the conditions under which digital data can be accessed. To meet the CIFA standards fully, the digital repository must support public access to project data in perpetuity. And this is where the CIFA standards sit slightly outside um, how different archives might be managed in different sectors. Um, within the archive standards of old, accessibility is actually a key part of those. And that means enabling access for the public and other um, specialists, for example, to use that data. Now, there might be other barriers around that. So there might be things like client permissions or sites at risk that you don't want all the information to be online for, but that doesn't preclude you submitting or depositing an archive. It just means you have to be very clear about how people can use it or even if they can't have access to it at the moment. It just means that everything around it should be very clear. Um, I'm going to I'm not going to go through the whole um, section in terms of these, but I did want to finish off the FAIR principles so that you actually know what they mean. <laughs> in terms of I or interoperability, digital data is uploaded to a data repository. And that data repository should be one that can exchange and make use of information with other platforms, facilitating data aggregation and cross searching. Metadata itself should use standard vocabularies which maximize data exchange. Now these are all things on um, the screen at the moment are things that both Tim and Ali alluded to with the new Oasis system. And that's why in some ways that we decided to kind of collaborate on running this session together because the two things are really tied up. And because Oasis itself is really helping facilitate the use of fair principles within heritage and within archeology. span um, It's probably worth mentioning as well that in other, um, across the four UK nations, not everybody uses OASIS in the same way and some areas such as Wales don't really um, require use of it. But in those different areas, there are different options. So using HERs, for example, um, of the existing national HERs, both within Northern Ireland and Wales and in Scotland, using OASIS as well, um, will, will kind of provide that level of interoperability. But these are all things to think about. And actually the use of those standard vocabularies that Ali showed us on one of the slides is a key part of that. And then finally, reusability. 
So data should be documented using metadata, there's that word again, that meets standards and provides information about provenance. Data should have a clear and transparent user usage license. So who can use the data is really important so that the data repository themselves can manage that reuse appropriately. Data formats should be limited to widely used and open formats consistent with what an archive needs. And what you'll find is if you go through the deposition process with a repository such as ADS, there will be lots of guidance about what those data and media standards are and how they should be used within your archive. In short, data itself should be easy to use and easily cited, meaning that it can be easily integrated into future research. Now, I'm just gonna hop back into my presentation, I hope, and finish off. Uh, there we go. So uh, now we understand a bit more about, or I think we understand a bit more about fairness for digital archives. Um, let's think again about those CIFA standards. The standard for archaeological archives, so uh, the ones that are referenced in all project briefs and the ones that we tend to work to if you're either a member or registered organisation or just working within the UK at the moment. Um, the statements on the slide indicate how CIFA standards can be met during everyday project delivery. Digital data created as part of an archaeological project must be managed to the same standard as all components of the project archive. This is not a new standard but there is a need for archaeologists to recognise that new techniques will result in new ways of working, which should also impact archives management. Project planning documentation, such as WSIs and project designs, must include a data management plan. This is something that I will be talking about in the next section. It's a key tool for digital archives management and something um, that you can use from the outset of a project, and it will help guide you through the step-by-step -step process of data management. Um, at each stage of the archaeological project. The digital data archive should be included within a selection process for the whole site archive. You are not required to deposit every single digital file, born digital or otherwise, as part of your archive. And selection really is a must for kind of keeping things um, to what's, I suppose, relevant for that, that use and that research need. The receiving repository for digital archives should be a trusted digital repository accredited by Core Trust Seal. This is the only way that archives can be truly fair and can also meet CIFA standards in terms of access and stability. An archive included on a CD in a box in a museum does no longer meet that need. So currently, the ADS is the only core trust seal archive which can be used, which is um, usable for archaeology and heritage organisations within the UK, though there are rumours of more to come. The, the kind of the reason for the core trust seal is essentially a quality stamp. It, the the um, repository has been through all the rigmarole of kind of showing and demonstrating how they can manage that data um, in perpetuity to the standards required to um, to kind of meet the fair principles. I mean, it's not, not specifically tied to that, but a lot of the principles are the same thing about accessibility, interoperability, but also stability. Um, the, across the four nations, there are also slightly different requirements in place regarding final deposition, but specific advice can be found through Historic Environment Scotland, through the Royal Commission in Wales, and through the HEO in Northern Ireland. Um, different groups are also looking at achieving that core trust seal um, in the future as well. So there may well be other archives um, for us to use. The important thing about the OASIS record is that is at the point as well that will tie all those different um, archives and repositories and unique identifiers together. Yes, yeah, so I'm just looking at a question here from Sinead. There'll be, in the next uh, session, I'll talk a little bit about data management plans and how you can find out more information, but there will certainly be more things coming as well as part of this project. Um, the, the, the FAIR principles themselves bring data management into the beginning of the project. It helps you think about digital archives from day one, just like the physical archives. A digital management strategy can be scoped out at project planning stages and then revisited throughout 
Um, but as an organisation, you don't need to reinvent the wheel with every new project, although there might need to be aspects that are tailored to every individual project. The DMP itself, so the data management plan, your metadata tables that are used and the selection strategy or the approach to selection strategy can all be based around organisational processes and um, kind of tailored using templates that already work within your organisation. And one of the things I'll talk about again in the next session is um, the things that will be available as part of the project. Um, so last slide, in short, in order to secure that vital process of project legacy, the stable archaeological archive, digital data must be part of a managed and appraised archive process. Without that, it is really hard to see how CIFA standards and guidance can be met or hard to demonstrate how they can be met. As uh, Aryan Apadurai in this uh, quote neatly sums up, our aim for all aspects of project archives should be about the creation of something deliberate and usable, not merely an accidental trace. The archive must therefore be appraised and ordered rather than a bundle of everything we've collected and more besides. In the long run, this will be more streamlined, more economic and show much better value for our archaeological projects. For both physical and digital elements, planning for and selecting the material considered essential to facilitate reanalysis and reinterpretation of a site is the only way to create a good archive. It also means that recording and depositing the project in a way that makes it findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable is the only fair way to do it. So there you go. And are there any more questions about that section before we head into a short break? Who, so Jeremy's asked, who archives digital data in HERs? Do you mean who manages the data within the HER or if you submitted data to a HER. Amanda, while Jeremy just sort of types a, a response to your question then, can I just flag something that Tim, because uh, Tim's had to leave us now, yes. but he, he, it's just quite relevant because we've been talking about what happens elsewhere as well. Yes. And he just wanted me to flag that um, the ADS in Wales are currently talking to Algeo in Wales about how to exchange information between HERs and Oasis. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be a new version for Northern Ireland as well coming soon. And they're yeah. also talking to the Isle of Man and Channel Islands about specific versions for them. So I just wanted to flag it just because it's relevant for people who are working for organizations that work in lots of different areas yeah. um it, there's lots i think that soon. probably answers some of jeremy's question as well actually because yeah. that's about if you're submitting data to repositories such as the royal commission wales or historic environment scotland who manages that data maybe yeah. um in which case it's Oh, who ensures the HER data is archived to the Creative Standards? I guess that's to do with the... Um... Oh, hold on, let's go. Okay, yeah, so Gary's saying there, the data would also need to go to a recognised digital archive as well. And there, more from Ash. I think, and, and just responding to Matt's response there, um, the, there will start to be a requirement within project briefs um, to do with digital data archiving with trusted digital repositories reasonably soon. Um, I think Algeo are certainly on board with the project and are, are kind of have been included in all aspects of this, the dig digital guidance as well. So they're very aware of how far along the project is. And that's the same as well for um see for requirements in terms of uh, registered organizations although with the recognition that these things are um kind of incremental and that it will need to be something that's introduced step by step okay so should we have a quick break now if people want to start um keep if there, anybody thinks of any additional questions and just wants to include them in the chat so we'll keep an eye on those as well 
So should we have five minutes then quickly and come back at just before quarter past to, to get back on? Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds fine to me. Lovely. I shall see everyone in five minutes. Hello there. I'm I'm back now. <laughs> I'm kind of looking at a blank screen. It's very um, unnerving. Um, but I'm assuming people are kind of coming back in and uh, I shall crack on with the next presentation in a minute or so. I've been noticing a couple of questions coming through the chat window um, as well. So I'm trying to respond to those. Um, if we've got some time at the end, we'll, we could always try and do another Q&A session as well if anything comes up. So I shall crack on. Let me just, I've got so many different windows open. I don't know where I'm, I am at the moment. So if I share my screen again, and you should be able to see that now. So I'll kick that off and hopefully you can see that first slide taking your digital temperature. I don't know whether it's because we're in the times of COVID, but I keep thinking about uh, temperatures and health checks. Um, so <laughs> this is one about your digital archives. Um, so again, a bit of background to the project. The Archaeological Archives Forum itself um, has overseen best practice in archives management within the UK for nearly two decades now. Most recently, the forum has overseen the development of guidance supporting digital data within archaeological projects. And just in case you haven't heard anything about the forum before, it's basically um, a forum of probably all of the organisations you would think should be sitting around that table, including FAME, CIFA, Algeo, um, the National Trust, the commissions, anyone who has an interest in archaeological archives, essentially, and it meets twice a year. Um, and for some reason, my presentation is going all by itself. So the Dig Digital project has been producing everyday guidance for digital archives aimed squarely at supporting archaeologists. The resulting guidance, Dig Digital Think Archive Create Access, has been developed by DeVentures. And as I mentioned before, this has all been done in partnership with the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists and funded by Historic England. We've been trying to create guidance documents and resources to help archaeologists plan for, collect, manage and archive their digital data as part of the overarching archaeological archive. You can find a comprehensive guidance document on the DigVentures website, but this will all be available through CIFA in, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. It's pretty much ready to launch. The team are currently developing additional resources um, such as tools and case studies to help support digital data and archive management. I'll give you a whistle stop tour of that resource, but first I'll just provide you with a bit of background. So uh, the current stage of the project is all about building those resources that help support implementation of data archives. It breaks down the process of digital data management into bite-sized chunks, but will not go into the technical details and data standards. It will signpost existing resources for those. There's plenty of stuff online about it. Um, it will explain how CFA's professional standards relate to digital data and what that means for everyday project processes, and will include each stage of a project, breaking down how teams can embed good digital data practice into archeological projects beginning at the planning stages. The issue of documentation of data is also included, and that's from the initial project information all the way through to keeping on top of metadata. Tips around how you might structure the project data itself are also included, exploring file names and project folders um, and their role within the archive preparation. The process itself, such as the different roles that individuals themselves might have throughout a project, also includes things like quality assurance procedures, um, which you may adopt throughout projects. And finally, the concept of preservation is also introduced. This looks at how um, types of files and formats used may affect its reuse in the future, as well as the role of the data repository in the long-term preservation of your archive. 
Each of those bite-sized chunks will be broken down and explored further, providing a comprehensive and practical insight at each stage. So what you can see on the slide there is just that breakdown of one of those elements of the resource itself. It will be supported with a number of case studies, quick visual guides and additional tools, some of which uh, we'll look at in a little while. Our aim is to provide something useful and logical that can be applied with a few tweaks to processes and procedures that many organisations already have in place. Each of the tabs you can see across the top will correspond to sections on the web resource and the guidance documents itself. And you can see here the, um, the web resource itself. And I'm just going to go back to that because I can give you a quick look at the resource here. So hopefully you can see my um, website here. So the web resource itself is going to look very much like the selection toolkit. In fact, it looks exactly the same if you can see this on your screen now. And each of those different sections um, that my internet's working, um, each of those different sections um, that you saw on that kind of colourful mind map of the whole resource um, will include both a kind of a descriptive background section and also where you can see these orange or orange bits, there'll be additional resources. So examples of things, case studies about something or a bit more information. So things like we were talking earlier about the different ways the UK nations manage digital data um, across them within the, the scope of Historic Environment Scotland, for example, or the Royal Commission in Wales, there'll be a breakdown of how that works as well. Um, and those will be in downloadable sections um, but it, yeah it just goes through each one of those aspects there's also the full guidance document that's already been written which is currently available through the dig ventures website will be downloadable on here so at the moment you can go and look at this it's kind of very very softly launched in the fact that you're the first people i've told it's actually available um, but eventually um, it won't be too long before that's actually out there and we've included the other information um, so one of the things I was going to talk about next was the actual um, the, the key tools that are kind of included in there. One of the uh, things to do first, I guess, within your digital data management is to look at the health check and action plan. Now, the questions that are appearing on the screen now, they provide a really um, just an insight into the, some of the questions that are in there, and we're going to have a look at those um, using a Jamboard in a minute. Essentially, if you answer yes to any of these questions, basically you're on your way to good digital data management. And I think a lot of organisations are already doing it. Um, this project was conceived literally years ago, like a decade ago. <laughs> and I think from where we started through to the point where we actually started to be able to do the project through to today when we're actually delivering it, things have changed very quickly. So um, I think that uh, a lot of organisations already manage their data internally very well because otherwise um, things get very messy very quickly. And what we need to do is just start to see how we can pull it out of organisations into repositories so it may, makes it fully accessible as part of the whole project archive. Um, so I was going to suggest as well, if nobody really minds going back to the jam boards, um, that we just have a look at a couple of those and see what people um, think in terms of responding to some particular questions. Um, I need to give you a new link if I can get to the chat window again. Here we go. So I'm just going to add this link into the chat window here. So you should see that now. And then that hopefully will take you to the Dig Digital Health Check. So this is really just to give you an idea of the kind of questions that we're asking. The reason that we've kind of created this action plan is because I've, we just realised when we were putting things together that what we didn't want to produce was something that you had to read a 40 page document in order to get to the two things that you actually needed to do. And what the action plan will help do is identify very quickly the areas that you might just need to tweak or you might need to bring in or have some additional training around um, rather than thinking it's a whole new thing. Um, so for this Jamboard, I've put a couple of questions on here and the blue post-it notes are just a kind of a 
added information. So the first question, so these are questions that actually appear on the action uh, planner, the health check. Do you set up an OASIS record for each project and update it as the project progresses? So if anybody wants to, <laughs> um, let us know. Um, you shouldn't, so Sinead, you've just said you need to install Jamboard first. You shouldn't need to. This should just be an open link. Uh, and I can see a couple of people adding yeses and noes in. And I think we need to bear in mind as well that obviously for different um, areas within the UK that it isn't necessarily a requirement to create an OASIS record for each project. Um, so it, the, the questions will be tailored. In terms of the use of them, this is the beginning of the process. And the, the reason why this is important for your digital data archives is this is about the findability. So this is what we talked about earlier. Um, the second question, do you use data management plans? Well, at the moment, nobody's really asking you to, unless you get a recent funding from um, Historic England, perhaps, or uh, research funding through something like AHRC, there aren't very many um, local planning authorities that would require this as part of the project brief, although that will now start to happen. So what we've tried to do is provide um, a DMP checklist, which is a completed one, which I'll run through very quickly, and also a blank template. So that can be tailored to your organisation. So you, we're trying to do some of the work that is like, it takes a while and um, it puts people off starting. <laughs> so if you just have to edit something and tailor it to how your organisation works, we're hoping that that will make those processes a bit easier. But it's really nice to see the range of um, responses coming through there. So I'm going to go through to the next page now. Um, do you collect metadata for the digital files in your project archive? Um, and the second one is about GDPR compliant privacy policy. A GDPR compliant privacy poly policy, which considers the management of digital personal data. So in terms of um, metadata, if you have got to the point of depositing an archaeological archive, you will be asked for the metadata that goes alongside. And if you don't start that earlier in the project, or at least if you're not aware that you're going to have to, it is a real pain. <laughs> so the the good thing about the use of a data management plan is it prompts you to think about all the things that you'll be required to do in order to deposit something. And actually, if you're doing those as you go through a project, it's a lot less work than it is to try and do it right at the end of a project. For, for something like metadata, if you think about your fines registers, your photo registers, your old slide catalogues, or rewriting all those slides and putting them in the wallets, it's the equivalent of doing that for your digital archive data. But it's not just for the photo records, for example, it's also for any documents or any other information you submit. Um, the question about GDPR is really just to prompt people to think, is there data within this digital archive that I'm about to deposit or information that's included in it? that shouldn't be because it's actually private information. So people's addresses, um, if you've run community projects, for example, have you got pictures of volunteers, names of um, your participants who might not want to be included or any information that identifies a person who might not want to be identified, if that makes sense. Um, so lots of yeses there, which is really good. <laughs> and then in terms of, um, Folder structures. So some of the aspects of the data management plan or the consideration of whether digital data is being managed in a good way is if an organisation has got things like uh, naming conventions for, and version control for individual files or a folder structure, which is um, very clear within an organisation that all members of a team can find, you'll probably have um, a good mechanism for um, organising your digital data when it comes to a repository. So your files will be named in a way that people can understand what they are and why they're there. And the folder structure means you could probably just pull out your selected digital archive and it will be nicely named and it will be nicely organised so that the repository can pull it into their system in a nice, easy way. But there you go, knowing it's a nightmare. Well, that's what <laughs> hopefully we can um, help a little bit with prompting people to get things organised across organisations. Um, 
and then the next C, there's a prompt for me right there. Go back to the presentation. Um, so what I was going to quickly show you was the oh, how do I do that? Um, was what this so that I'm going to make this kind of more colorful and, and attractive and more interactive to use. But essentially, this is how it's going to the, that health check is going to be set up so that people can kind of quickly work out which boxes have got a no in them and what they need to do about it. So, for example, do you use a data management plan? The other part of the question is, is it something that's um, consistent with the CIFA standard? So you'd have to review the data management plan that's with the um, within the dig digital resource in order to see whether it meets that need. But where you've got something like, um, do you have a process in place for collecting metadata? If you have a no against that, you might then be able to just think, well, what do I need to do about it? Who needs to do it? And how are we going to implement that? The other reason to have or to use the health check is also, also to be able to demonstrate how you're approaching digital data management within the organization. So if you had a looming registered organization visit, for example, if you know that that you know things aren't 100 percent there or archives aren't necessarily being fully deposited as yet, you can at least show what um, what steps are being taken within an organization to try and implement the process is needed in order to get that to happen. So it means that it's kind of you can you, you can put something in front of a panel and say, look, we know about this and we're trying to do something. And these are the steps we're taking very much in the same way as the deposition of um, physical archives has been managed as well. And I'll just go through. I can't find the next slide. Um, so we've mentioned data management plans a fair amount. Um, this is the structure of the data management plan that's included as part of the archive. And I was going to basically show you, I've got this up here. There you go. So there's two versions of this. There's one that's a checklist, which is the one that you can see on my screen here. There's also a Word document, which is fully editable. So the idea is that each of these sections are the um, areas that you'll complete and this will be appended to your WSI or your project design. When you then get to assessment stage or the UPD stage, you would update it. And you can um, let's make this a bit bigger. I might put <laughs> it on point. the website, though. Good point, Matt. Can you see? Can everybody see that? That's, uh, so I, I just wanted to show you this because it will it will just show you how the checklist is organized. Um, Basically, it tells you which questions you should consider within each box, um, but also provides a guidance or um, links through to guidance, such as the ADS good guide, guides for good practice. But also points you towards some, you know, if there's things like good naming formats. So if you didn't have version control within an organization or folder structures, there are places that you can go to find out the best way to set these things up. Um, and there's also example responses within there as well. So the idea is that it kind of hopefully minimizes the amount of new things that you need to think about and just helps you find your way through to actually completing something. There does need to be a data management plan done for each individual project. But as I said before, a lot of these things to do with um, data standards or how you operate within an organization will just be repeated within each one. So once you've done one, you're then just updating it for each individual project. And finally, something to talk about in terms of selection. So and this is really just a very quick point about selecting digital data. It does still say, and I will endeavour to get that changed within the CIFA standard or within the CIFA guidance, rather, that it should be all born digital data included in the archive. And that is not the case. Um, what should be included in an archive is all the information that should be needed to facilitate that reuse, reinterpretation and access. Um, the, hold on, let me just, um, as with other parts of the project archive, it's um, unlikely that each file will be needed in order to retain that, um, that legacy within the preserved archeological archive itself. The selection process should be undertaken and agreed in advance of deposition with all the relevant stakeholders um, such as the project advisory team or the intended repository or the planning group. Um, 
and it's this is part of the physical archive selection process as well so it's just all part and parcel of the same thing um, you can find more about the sex the selection toolkit itself on the CIFA website and the link you can see is at the bottom of the screen there. Throughout the project delivery, particular stages will provide review points where you can update the selection strategy and the data management plan. So that provides that opportunity to review, um, have input from specialists and also evaluate based on the significance of the archaeology that's been recorded and recovered and also what's happened in the project, because obviously, as we all know, things change. Um, the selection strategy and the data management plan can be amended as, as it progresses, so they are living documents, so don't feel like if you put something in either of these documents at the beginning that um, you can't change that as you go through. And where are we on time? We've got a couple of minutes left, oh I think I have got a couple of minutes left, in which case I just wanted to uh, go back to my jam board. So I know it feels like a slight obsession at the moment. But in terms of selection, I thought it would be useful if anybody wants to play a selection game. Um, these are just some of the elements of your archive that you might include. And if anybody feels brave, if you want to move one of those uh, or all of those into what should be included in the digital archive um, and just see what people think. I should say as well that there is no black and white here. It will depend entirely on the project, on the research aims, on the views of the stakeholders you're working with, the people who are paying the bill, um, but also the repository as well might have different requirements for different information, especially when there are more repositories than the, the one we're using at the moment. But essentially, I think we've got, there you go, that's it. <laughs> so everybody knows what you need to know about the selection of data. And I think it's some of the important points there are certainly what I think has changed in recent years is people's um, view of how and what makes information um, useful, how it makes it accessible and how it makes your archive reusable. So when it comes to your final project, um, deposition, for example, the difference between depositing your beautiful final technical report as a PDF compared to depositing each individual element within its raw and editable files, such as the Word documents, the specialist reports, the tables, people will still use and go to that final PDF as your final expression of what the project discovered, but they still will want to have access to those um, other files as well, which I think everybody has recognised within the Jamboard. So just as a, a final uh, roundup of things you can do today. So the project itself is midway through in terms of this implementation stage. Um, you can find all the documents that have been prepared on the Dig Ventures website and I'll put a link in the chat window once I've finished. Um, the guidance document is big and heavy and very wordy. Um, it was the the kind of all the a collation of all the information needed in order to kind of move it into this next phase of actually making it accessible and <laughs> usable um, to go back to the fair principles. Um, so you can you can look at a whole document if you like to access information in that way and want to read from the beginning why this is important, um, why this project's been done and also what it is entailed. It's all in there. The action plan is available in its current form, which is just a Word document with a table in it. Um, and you can also look at the data management plan guidance and the checklist and the editable version of that is already available. Um, I think that's just jumped ahead all by itself again. Um, and yes, yeah, so what we'll be doing from now on is, in, is including those extra resources. So the case studies, the examples and the workflows. Um, we're also just about to start putting together a massive uh, meta metadata, <laughs> um, a completed metadata for a an example data set. So what I'm hoping is if people can, can see that they'll also, because it's editable, it will be usable as well. So there are some types of information which that might be useful for just to see how you might explain different types of information such as what do, what do we mean by context um, or what do we mean, mean, we mean by deposit, which um, can be different depending on the different organisations you work to. So um, finally, I should probably um, say thank you for listening. It's been an odd experience because I'm just talking to my screen and can't see anybody, but I hope that's been helpful. And if you've got any questions, 
just uh, let me know. And like I say, I'll put the relevant links in the chat window now. Okay. Oh, and there are some questions coming up there. So Penelope, for the community projects and volunteer archaeology projects, yes, I think so. And what I'm trying to think about at the same time of this is how community organisations might use this information. I should say as well that the information, hopefully, certainly the web based resources should be far more accessible than the full guidance document, if that makes sense. So I'm hoping it will be uh, more accessible. One of the things that I have looked at a couple of um, previous projects that have been done with community heritage organisations, and I think it's quite unclear at the moment is what what size of archive, and including physical, is kind of residing with different groups and what kind of information um, people would be interested in having. But it, it certainly is an aspect of um, the whole project is to make the information kind of accessible to everybody. Um, so, yeah, it might be maybe catch up with you at another point to see if the current information feels a bit too. Um, wow. Dense, <laughs> for want of a better word. I don't think so. I think we were going to pass over to Ash now, but I got a feeling her camera might be frozen and I'm just, I don't know if she can hear us or not. She might just be stunned by... <laughs> can you hear me yes okay maybe it might help if i turn my camera off perhaps okay i'm going to share my screen while you start talking as well just with a, a little bit of this okay so this section is designed to be a discussion. <laughs> it's designed to be a discussion. So around implementation and user support communities. So one of the things that we wanted to explore um, when we look at doing our Oasis rollout workshops is whether there would be a need, a requirement um, or a desire to have a long-term user support community um, for Oasis. Now, this was not aimed to place the resources that we will be producing and also they just have produced as well um, and will not replace the AES help desk. It's more about enhancing peer-to-peer -peer, um, support and maybe particularly for community groups, for example, who might be more inclined to speak to um, their contemporaries rather than um, wanting to go direct to ADS. It might be slightly less intimidating. So we basically wanted to know what you guys thought about this, as to whether you need, what training you might need in order to implement things for um, implement uh, Oasis within your organisation or within digital archiving within your organisation. Um, Matt has popped to say the audio is not great. Can everyone else hear me? I think you're cutting out a little bit, Ash. Do you want me to try and take over for a minute, Ash? Yeah, Let's see if you get right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it, it is a really bad connection. So I sort of, I, I, not quite. First of all, right? Can someone just answer me? Can you see my PowerPoint rather than my children? Because I'm <laughs> Zoom's gone all a bit crazy, and I can't work out which screen I'm sharing. Mm, yes, I can see it, Alison. Oh, good. Well, that's good because um, I'm sure as beautiful as my children are, you don't need to see them. So, so um, we're keen to, to develop this user community. Um, and one of the things we've done, I've just shared in the, um, the chat a Jamboard because for the last few minutes of the session, I'm going to bring it up here. You can hopefully see it. We're, we're quite keen to sort of start some discussion. We, we think we know what we'd like, um, what people might need um 
but I'd like to know what you think you might lead. So we've got just two questions. Um, first of all, what training would be good? Um, so if, if anyone's got any thoughts, this is a place to stick them, really. Um, the rollout workshops that we're delivering as part of Oasis are very much... Um, looking at a sort of two to two and a half hour tailored session to talk you through the new oasis and actually give you a a form to fill in and talk you through it really and and hold your hand through the process oh crikey hang on I'm just changing the settings I thought I'd change them but Mm -hmm. I will change it again it's all it's all going wrong this session for me hang on one second anyone who has the link should be able to do it hang on let's try the link again I'm going to give you another link it might be sometimes you it's anyone can view it and anyone can edit it oh yep you're right it does say that hang on thanks Amanda that's all right <laughs> right here you go try the link again everyone and we'll, we'll get there this time yeah so it's working now yeah um Yep, so you should be able to see it on your screen as well. But we, we're keen to know what training would be good. This is a time to start to tell us if you're after sort of um, something that looks different to a sort of webinar like this, then there is scope for us to be quite flexible and start to deliver more bespoke training. Um, that's the plan anyway. The next question, so if you go through to the next page, I'm going to flick between the two and people can start to start to think about them, is would the development of a user support community be attractive to you? I mean, the, the way we're comparing this is when we're doing work on GIS or when I do a lot on Photoshop, there's forums out there where people will answer your questions all the time. Um, and it's it's really helpful um, to have that place to ask those questions and I personally think that if we could start to get that sort of level of conversation happening um, with with users, then that's going to be a really helpful tool for everybody. Um, Certainly at least one person agrees with me so far, so so that's good. I've got on, just going back as well, um, someone's comment, Sinead's commented on the chat, it would be helpful to have training at various levels. So one for companies and data managers set up, um, then also CPD workshop training for staff who write reports. And and that's exactly what we're planning essentially. Um, So there'll be ones aimed at commercial archeology span units, but we can tailor them to different people within them. We will also be running them for um, museum staff, historic environment services type staff, lots and lots of, of different workshops and the beauty of this is when when we um developed the project initially on behalf of historic england it was a pre-covid world and these workshops were designed to be taking place in six locations around the country um and they would have been very set format the beauty in some ways of, of changing to a, a, a sort of more digital fluid system through COVID is that we're going online and that's enabled us to rather than do six workshops I think we're aiming to do 22 um, which gives us a huge amount more scope to actually tailor them for people so there's not many positives of this year but for us that is one of them um, how to generate a shapefile for site location, ideally using open source or web. Yeah, we can certainly build that into the training. Um, so that there's, I'll leave these jam boards open after, well, so I'll leave this one, which is ours open after this. And if, if going back and talking to colleagues, you think of things that would actually be helpful to you, go and stick them back up here and we'll, we'll have a look when we're starting to develop the actual programme. Um, I'd like to, th- think that we can tailor the CPD accredited by CIFA, um, which in terms of organisations buying in might be able to, to, to help people. I'd like to think that if there's organisations that won't buy in, maybe we could have a chat with them on the phone and see if we can get them to buy into it. I don't know. Maybe I'm being unrealistic. Um, so that's where we are with Oasis um, and user support communities. I don't know, Manda, if there's anything you particularly want to say about digital archiving and user support communities or? Um, at the moment, there there isn't anything within this current project stage in terms of implementation, but that doesn't mean that there won't be in the future. <laughs> so I think the same as um, Ali said, really, if you feel like um, there would be some use to kind of how to develop stuff it might be that we just have something through 
um, either Facebook groups or some kind of wiki groups of more like how do, how do different people do this? Does anybody have any top tips around um, metadata management or those sorts of things? I think I think a lot of the um, um, information as kind of peer to peers as people start doing this more and more, I think will be really useful, especially when people start finding um, quick ways of doing things or great software for helping the process. Um, there's never a bad time to share um, great top tips. So that's one of the aspects that I'd quite like to look at as well in the future is um, some good how to's, but I think some of the resource will include some of that, but it's that kind of peer to peer support that I think would be a really nice way to um, help support people doing good data management. Awesome. Ash, I don't know if you can hear us still or if your audio is any better, if you want to add anything, but I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah. OK, that's good. Apologies to everyone. I'm not quite sure what happened there to my connection. Um, but yes, just basically building on what Alison and Manda have said, if you've got any further ideas, comments, um, thoughts about how we could go forward in terms of training, but also having a think about if we are to run a peer to peer support community, how would you envisage that might happen whether that's on um, a gist forum whether it might be on a slack channel um, any thoughts or comments you have about anything like that would be great i like somebody's comment of less of it is that less <laughs> <in altogether? laughs> i, I can work out if that was like they, they'd listened to us so long they didn't want to hear from us ever again <laughs> Anyway, I think on that note, we're sort of drawing to an end. We have to have a um, final poll, which we'd really like everyone to have a, a quick fill in, if it's OK, Doug, to launch that poll. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's been a really positive session. I don't know if you've got any final thoughts, Manda, as well. No, I just hope it's been useful. There, there'll be more to come, I think, both from um, the Oasis Project and the Dig Digital. There's definitely stuff happening in the future. So um, if you look out for things and do feel free to get in touch with me directly as well if you've got any questions about the dig digital resource and likewise if anyone wants to know anything more about oasis <laughs> rollout of workshops contact ash or i and um, we've got a sign up form and we will be sending out more information i'm quite aware that it's we've gone quite quiet on dates um but it's a changing changing year this year isn't it so um we hope to be able to give some dates mid to end of november and training will be happening later this year well december january february time thank you